Thanks for watching the Henry AI Labs Deep Learning Podcast. Today I'm joined with Yannick Kilcher. Yannick is, works in the data analytics lab at ETH. He has a great YouTube channel. I really enjoy watching his uh, paper summary videos. If you like any of the videos that I'm making, you'll definitely also like checking out this channel. I'm going to put the link in the description at the end of the talk. So uh, Yannick, thanks for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's cool. <laughs> So what we're going to talk about is uh, population-based search and uh, a presentation at ICML that I really thought was interesting about emphasizing uh, diversity and novelty in search. So the first question I just wanted to uh, start by generally talking about uh, your opinion on population-based search and uh, the differences between population-based search and like gradient descent going straight for one solution. Yeah, so the, the, the kind of main difference uh, is that in population-based search, as the name implies, you maintain kind of a, a large population of solutions. So you don't want to limit yourself to just one trajectory, say I start here and then I run towards my goal, but you kind of maintain a lot of hypotheses of what the solution could be. And then you kind of want to update all of them at the same time. And so there's many different variants of population-based search, but they all have this this thing in common where you maintain many solutions and you kind of bet on one of them becoming uh, a good one, basically. Yeah, so one other thing, they, they uh, present their paper where they have the robot walking and if it breaks one of its legs, for example, it can go back to the map elites table and, and say, okay, well, I've lost this leg, but I think maybe this solution, I, was, I wasn't too clear on how that would really be related so I was maybe wondering if you had a more insight on that yes so the so the maybe the the context is yeah you, you want to teach a robot to walk and the robot had six legs I believe so and if you think of what's a solution to the problem a solution is kind of an, an algorithm that takes the current sensor input and outputs how to move the motors right so and if you just have like your gradient descent algorithm converging on the best solution of how to move the robot it's just going to be like oh these are the sensors okay i'm going to move like this like this like this like this but if one leg breaks of course you're lost because you only know this one way of of moving and now the sorry so you only know this one way of moving basically and that's it but in population based search if you Think of the solution as a way to move. You maintain many, many ways to move. Um, so you basically, the ob objective, if you can call it like this, is algorithm, find me a lot of different ways to move, right, with my six legs. And now if one of my legs, I still can evaluate all of them. I still can find, okay, which one's the best? But if now one of them falls away, I have all these other solutions that I can try, right? So then what they would do is like this life falls away. Now they just reevaluate all of those solutions while only having five legs. And the best of those like is much more likely to kind of um, work than if you had just your single solution. So that kind of, that's the, it's population based because you maintain many different ways of solving the problem. Yes, yeah, so I was also thinking about like using the search algorithms that control neural architecture search and things like that. So I was trying to think of how you might extend these ideas from the robot walking with six legs to the RNN controller designing the convolutional network. Like maybe I might have uh, like more of a uh, storage constraint or more of a latency constraint and I could jump to a different solution like that. I was just wondering uh, how you think like um, these ideas of population-based search translate into the neural architecture search and specifically if it really is important because like you've got i feel like in neural architecture search you have such a direct signal with the classification accuracy like i don't see as much variance i suppose in the uh, in the objective function yeah i i really think this population-based approaches they shine in so they shine in multiple different areas, but one area where they shine is definitely when the environment changes. Uh, so when you know something about whatever your input 
changes like the robot losing a leg. So in kind of neural architecture search, you might you might find these methods working if you then go for, let's say, transfer learning. So you kind of train your network on one task. You want to ac actually do it in another task, right? And then if you maintain many solutions and you can evaluate all of them in a tr in this transfer setting, it's much more likely that one of them, you know, is going to be is going to be fine. So, but you're right. Of, I also believe that directly in architecture search, may maybe it's not, um, maybe it doesn't yield that many great results. Though, the other, of course, the other. Um, area where these methods shine, and this is with respect to algorithms like novelty search, um, which can be implemented as a population-based method, is they gave this really good example of deception in a search problem. So a deception would be like if you have a robot walking a maze and the robot just wants to get to the goal, right? And you would program it, the robot to be rewarded the closer it gets to the goal. But if like there's a wall in between and you actually need to go around the wall, kind of, then for a while you would need to move away from the goal in order to reach it. So if you mm -hmm. have like a pure objective driven approach, you just go straight to the, the goal, you would always get stuck at the wall. But if you then kind of do what is called a novelty search, where you basically reward the robot for things it has never done before, it would actually find its way around the wall. So you can maintain population of solutions that all kind of explore the space and that in our neural architecture search maybe it's of a benefit that actually you know if, if I I probably always benefit from like adding more layers or neurons or something like this but maybe I actually want to prune some stuff first and then add some more stuff so I maybe want to get worse first before I can get even better right so mm. so this is a region where I can imagine that happening but i don't know yeah i was thinking uh the changing environment i definitely think like when you deploy a model and then you're getting new data that you could frame that as a changing environment and then also i was thinking about like in the context of gans which is something that i think is really interesting that the discriminator classifying the gan sam the generator samples it's a changing environment because of the generators update so maybe having some kind of population-based GAN or discriminator model might help it avoid that like uh, continual learning problem I guess is sort of an yeah that that could that might as might very well be uh, there are approaches to GANs I believe where you basically you have like many discriminators and each one kind of only has let's say has its own limited view on the data and you're trying to kind of fool all of them at the same time, but it's not the same thing, but yes, uh, I think that, that might yeah, make that, sense, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that multiple generator, multiple discriminator model too. I think that's really interesting as well. So then one other thing I was curious about is this idea of goal switching and how that might relate to the like auto ML on our existing more like heavily studied things like classification, localization, semantic segmentation. Like, how do you think goal switching could be important? Like, one idea I had is maybe if you've got like multi-class classification and it's got like a really low uh, false positive rate or something on like one class, you might say, well, you've somehow learned a decision boundary on that class. Or do you think that that wouldn't generalize and that there's no sense in goal switching in like a multi-class classification problem? So... Yeah, in general, well, when you think of goal switching in general, what, how they introduced it was also in the context of like this population based search of these map elites. Maybe it's kind of so what map elites, the algorithm does basically is it says, OK, I have a number of dimensions that I could solve the problem on. And they introduced, OK, let's take life on Earth uh, needs to whatever survive. So I can either be like a super tall creature right, to reach food that no one else can reach. I can be a super fast creature, right, to kind of run away from everything, or I can be a super heavy creature so that no one can attack me. And so these are kind of the dimensions that you can solve the problem of reproduction and survival. And um, within, so th what Map Elites does, it, it would segment this uh, area, so let's say size and speed, it would segment this into a grid, 
and then in each grid it would kind of maintain the best solution so far that is within that grid and then what they see is when they then kind of evolve this over time and um, improve each each grid is that inventions let's say inventions algorithm discoveries in one grid say for a very fast creature they would then kind of be adapted to the very let's say the very heavy creatures so, so it's like a fast creature kind of discovers all oh, longer legs make me even faster maybe the longer legs can then be combined in the heavy creature to do something else so this kind of goal switching it's think of like feathers being first kind of developed or, or um, evolved for warmth for temperature regulation then being goal switched over to adapt it for flight um, so in the in terms of multi-class classification i guess it's a bit of a different problem if you just have one classifier but you can definitely make the argument that since you know you're learning maybe to classify one class really well have a low false positive rate you have learned very good features for that class and if some other sure. class kind of uh like the a zebra is a, a horse with stripes and then uh the horse is a horse but with the feature stripes being really low you can mm. probably classify that better or something uh, i'm making stuff up here but it's a bit <laughs> of a different context i i feel um the if you have a single classifier do multi-class classification um but definitely the logic applies in the feature space, I would say, where you learn features for one class and they might become useful for another class. Yeah, I had this other thought sort of when you're discussing that is like, uh, what about like multi-class, multi-task learning? Like maybe my intermediate features get mapped to a classifier, get mapped to a segmentation, get mapped to a GAN. Like could goal switching improve multi-task learning? Yeah, I would definitely say so i think that that's exactly what we're seeing uh when you look at for example pre-training so if you think of like these whatever these these newest big language models like bert or something they're really good at uh tasks i don't know i don't know what it was an nlp task uh labeling of sentiment sentiment classification yes, is the yeah. classic right that's the popular Maybe, one yeah. I don't know if, <laughs> if, if they evaluate on that because it's so easy but let's say bird is really good at sentiment classification but if you were to just to train it out right on sentiment classification it's probably not going to work because there's just too little signal but then what happens is you pre-train it as a language model as this masked language model and it kind of gets really good at simply comprehending a language and that skill can then be kind of adapted over into the into the uh, cement uh, sorry into the sentiment classification uh, realm. So I I think if you look at yeah something like pre-training or at multitask as you say, um, then definitely one ta what the addition of a task might give rise to certain features that then all of a sudden can be adapted by another task, whereas if you just trained the latter task by itself, that maybe would have been too difficult. So, so that, yeah, I, there's yeah. definitely an, an analogy. So then what I think about is, so I'm going from my pre-trained language model into sentiment classification, and maybe I also add like uh, question answering document summarization named entity, like this uh, like vector of tasks that it can go do. Mm. I'm then mm -hmm. curious, like, when you're goal switching, it's like, how do you then combine the features later on? Or do you just like take it as if I need this task, I'll go to this model? Like, yeah. Well, the question here is, do you, whether or not you implement this as a single model and kind of refer to the goal switching of features within that model, or whether you also do this now as a population based method where basically you maintain, you, you maintain different neural networks for different combination of these tasks, um, then you, you'd actually need a method to kind of combine and reproduce the neural networks themselves, which I, yeah, I, I see that's, that's going to be a bit of a difficult <laughs> task, like some cross distillation or some, something crazy. Um, yeah, I don't know how that will work exactly. <laughs>
Yeah, I just wonder about two things. It's like, uh, do for my population-based search, sh could you have like the weights be the population, like different sets of weights, or would it necessarily need to be like taking apart the layers and designing new internal like cells as in the architecture search? Like, because if I just have the weights, maybe I could treat the uh, diversity search or goal switching as like stochastic weight averaging and just like mesh them all together when I'm finished with my goal switching at the end. But if it's, if, yeah. So it's, if it'd I, definitely be, if you wanted to, if you, yeah, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to implement your multitask, uh, multitask tasking as a population based approach where, yeah, you could def, it would definitely give you an easier time if you keep the architecture of your neural networks the same and simply have different weights yeah and then you could in, indeed consider something like weight averaging or or um, yeah i guess a more modern approach would be like a distillation from a, the two teacher mm -hmm. models into one child model it's actually a good metaphor for a for a reproduction kind of a <laughs> distillation from multiple teacher model don't know if anyone's done that yet but yeah I guess that, that might be the way to do it. If you also maintain different architectures for different problems, it, that might be a bit of a, of a, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting thing too. If you have the goal switching and then you model distill it all into one model, that is sort of the... Yes. Well, if you think of map elites, right, you'd, you'd, simply, you'd simply distill it into the, the appropriate. I don't even know what the, what the axis would be. Um, probably... I can imagine, okay, you have like three tasks, so you have three axes, and then you'd mix the task maybe in accordance on how far up your of these axes you are, or something like this. It could huh. be. It's not exactly map elites because your actual um, objectives are on the axis, but I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I, just to backtrack one step, I want to talk about uh, like diversity-centric search, novelty, like when I was thinking about that, I was like, can't you just initialize it such, a, such that it has maximum diversity? Like, can't you just initialize the population such that they're all like uniformly spaced and then search locally from there? I, so I just wonder what you think on that and how this is different from that. So, yeah, in these, in these diversity search algorithms, basically what you're, you're doing is you're your only goal is, or your, one, your main goal, that depends on the algorithm, but let's say your only goal is to find diverse um, behaviors or diverse solutions, diverse whatever. I think the main problem with that is, is that the search space is so extremely large that you're going to have a, a hard time even, even defining what a kind of a uniform distribution is because it's such a high dimensional space that even if you sample uniformly it, it's it's almost empty like you're <laughs> almost right you're not you're not getting anywhere yeah. because you have finite you have a finite computer you need to implement an algorithm even if you even if my computer can hold a hundred thousand different uh, members of a population in high dimensions that is nothing right so to me, yeah, the initialization might be definitely important, um, but I don't think you'll you'll get around some sort of iterative procedure and getting around weeding out uh, weeding out things such that you have space for interesting things. Because ultimately, what you want to find is something interesting. In the robot maze example, the novelty search basically is here's a robot you start it right and then you want to do something that you haven't done yet right so if the robot crashes into a wall the first time that's a good thing you say ah oh, cool you haven't done that yet but <laughs> if it crashes into the wall the second time you're like oh, you've done that already right so you 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 basically need a measure of saying how close two behaviors are but if the robot has crashed into every wall once the only thing it can do if it wants to do something new 
is actually go around the wall and then you're like oh cool you've done <laughs> something new but the, the space of behaviors often is so large that you can't simply enumerate all the all the behaviors so you i think that's the the main problem why you can't just make it diverse from the beginning yeah when i was thinking about that i was thinking that maybe the like reward function if you're like navigating the maze it needs to be more refined so like if it crashes into the wall that needs to be like I don't know, plus three, some, some like unique signal, I feel like in order to create that kind of, cause like thinking of if it's just like reward zero everywhere, but one, if you hit that, uh, finish line and then maybe some kind of like discounting for how long it takes you to get there. It's like, I don't see how it could interpret that it's done a new behavior. If all it has is it. So, so yeah. to me, it feels like it's all about the design of the reward space now to implement such a thing. Yes, absolutely. So the, that definitely if you wanted to do novelty search, you would need to implement a measure of how close two behaviors are. So you, there, there's no way around it. And I think that's kind of crux of the of this method is that by specifying how close two behaviors are, so what, what constitutes novelty and what doesn't, you already implicitly kind of telling the robot something about the nature of, of the world. So I think that the kind of the objective, because they now say, oh, we don't give the robot the objective of reaching the, the target. We simply give it the objective of not doing the same thing twice. I think the, the kind of objective sneaks in, in mm -hmm. the, like, again, through the specification of how, of you, how close are two behaviors. But definitely, um, this is just kind of a really simple example. What they want to say is that these methods really become important when you have ambitious objectives right in the maze we can all agree if we just design the reward crashing walls bad um you don't have to actually go straight to the goal you can you know but uh go around walls good and so on <laughs> then it's easy right mm -hmm. but in really ambitious objectives like i don't know uh flying reaching the moon in the in the 1960s uh designing general ai uh, curing cancer and so on we don't actually know how to design the reward right because we don't know which steps need to be fulfilled in order to to uh fly to the moon i guess now we do in hindsight right but we you mm -hmm. couldn't have predicted we don't know which steps need to be discovered in order to cure cancer and it's very, very probable, if you look at history, that the fundamental discoveries that lead to us curing cancer will not directly come from cancer research. That's that's their entire point, right? It's not mm -hmm. like you can have a goal, go straight towards it. If it's like a really ambitious goal, very probably the solutions will come in part from extremely non-related fields. And they and you kind of have to make advances everywhere, and in order to solve that problem. So the 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 question of it's all design it's all about designing the reward. Yes, but we would have to know how the reward must be must look. And in these really ambitious objectives, we don't. And that's that's where they argue. Well, the best thing actually you can do is to just explore and you just find interesting things along the way, and you kind of hope that these interesting things will come. No, you know the interesting things will combine to form new interesting things, right? But you just don't know where you're <laughs> going to end up, right? Yes, yeah, so I guess maybe you could just keep a tra like the trajectory of states and use that as your signal of novelty. But then I think like if you've got like a robotic arm with like X degrees of freedom, it's like the state space would be too infinite to really like say, oh, well, this was significantly, this is a significantly different uh, sequential procedure of states and this other thing. So then the next thing, yes, yeah, so I think this is a good transition into their pick breeder experiment. And so anyone who listens to this who hasn't uh, watched their talk, the pick breeder is like uh They've got these generator neural networks with uh, sets of weights and they have like humans go on and they pick two of the generated images to blend together and derive a new image. And so this repeats on and on until it goes from like 
uh, just like a spiral pattern into like a skull face drawing or a butterfly drawing or something like that. And they, so this idea is supposed to represent open-endedness in an environment. And I, so I, it just generally, I, I just found it to be really interesting. I think it's one of the things in their talk that you look at it and you're like, oh, that's interesting. What What is going on here? But it's like the the mutation is really guided by the human search, which is so complex, I feel like. I was just wondering what you thought of that uh, pig breeder experiment. Yeah, it's really cool. And it's 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 actually the, the basis for their entire book. So I've read the, the book, the um, why greatness cannot be planned, I believe. I forgot the title. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah, but um, so th this, they they actually they kind of start out with this as a motivational example of what if what if the only goal is to do something interesting and um, with, without any objective. So all you do is kind of choose slight variations on a current picture, and uh, you see what you end up with. And I thought I thought it illustrates their points extremely well. So it illustrates for example, goal switching is that so if you were done with your sequence of image manipulations, you could then save it into the database and someone else could pick up from it and then kind of continue it. And since every human finds slightly different things interesting, right, you could take someone else's final result and say, ah, you know, that, that kind of looks weird, but then you your modifications to it will be different than ha that human continued uh, breeding the picture so what you you end up is that, and they show this for example one picture ends up being a car and um, it had been adapted from an alien face where the eyes of the alien face became the wheels of the car and so that the first the first person might have been like oh this this, this looks more and more like an alien face. I'm going to you know, make it more like an alien face. And then the second person is like, oh, that kind of looks nice. I'm going to modify it in a different... So they, they, basically, they basically give this example of if you have an ambitious goal, like getting to a car just from these very simple picture generation networks, then the stepping stones to get there have nothing to do with cars and the people that did it didn't have a car in mind while going there. And the second thing is that if you try to get a car from the beginning, and I believe they've, they write, they've done this. If you try to, you, you can't like, mm -hmm. it's just the, the, the sequence of things that you have to go through is so uh, complicated and convoluted that if you were to try to end up with a result, it's, it's basically impossible. Uh, so, these kind of illustrate their points very, very nicely. Um, and it, I mean, it's a cool experiment in itself, but they yeah, use yeah. it kind of as a basis metaphor for then uh, uh, going on, jumping off. Yeah. yeah, I just think it's so interesting, this idea that it's like, you can't design a car unless unless you don't try it, unless you just happen to come across that. It's sort of like, I think about like, if I, I was to fire up GarageBand and start trying to make a song, it's like, I don't know exactly what it's going to sound like. I'm just going to kind of explore until I come across something. So then I was thinking about like, like with the GANs and the way that the GANs design images. Like, so this is a, like sort of a design I, I drew up that I'm curious what you think of. It's like, what if the generator just like tries to make some object and then a pre-chain classifier says, oh, I think it looks like this maybe. And then you send it to like a refining network. So the GAN just sort of searches for objects and then some classifiers are like, oh, I think it looks like, sort of like how the pick breeder, sort of like how we're like, oh, I think this looks like a skull or whatever. So I'm going to try to, you know, refine it now. Do you think that would be an interesting thing or? So you'd have like a two-stage process. First you do something general and then it gets classified and then you'd have like a special uh, generator just for the skull class and the special discriminator just for that. Yeah, I, I don't see why not. Um, it might be hard. It might be hard to get the first uh, generator to to be sufficiently diverse. Um, so you might might need some kind of discriminator signal at the even at the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. So so then yes, I, but, that, I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, like how do you think the pick breeder experiment could become fully automated such that there's no human in the loop? It, yeah, that's that's a thought I had as well because it, to me it seems that the 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 kind of um, of course the resulting pictures, the fact that they look like human objects or hu recognizable objects, is a, a result from them being um, being bred by humans. Like the fact that it looks like a car or a skull or something like this is is very much. But also, I, I guess that that could be abstracted in we we just not expect the results to be like human recognizable objects but maybe something else uh, I, the much more deeper um, construction in pick breeder is the fact that the measure of interestingness is provided by the humans right so the, the humans they they click on a picture and then they get variants of that picture and they click on the one that they most like this this sense of interestingness of ah, I like this one this that's what's that's the fundamental core that's provided by the humans as an input to the system that's what drives the entire thing that's exactly the same as before it's when you right when you teach the robot which two behaviors are close enough like oh no that's too close to before that's not novel or yes that's sufficiently different than before that is novel right it, it, this this sense is somehow you either need to specify it or yeah you need to have the human in the loop to provide it I, I feel it's very very hard to capture that in an algorithm as as of today yeah like something i think about is like maybe i'd have like my a thousand class image net classifier and then maybe I'd have like a, like a style classifier, like a neural style transfer network that I've like chopped off the, uh, at like some intermediate feature, I'm gonna take that as my style. And so maybe I'm like classifying, I think it's like an airplane and then I kind of like this style for it. That's sort of like my, like how I would think about trying to automate that like, like I don't know, I guess like, I don't know if I, I guess it's interesting, but I also feel like when you're doing the pick breeder, you're kind of like, oh, I'm going to try it now. Now that I see this vision, I'm going to try to make it like look like that now, I suppose. Like, I, yeah, yeah, the, I think, yeah, yeah. Like, so I think they, I could they, mold this into a skull and then you start doing yes. that. Yeah. Yes, they, they're very much. So they're not they're not advocating random exploration. What they're advocating is basically if you have an ambitious goal, then you basically don't know the stepping stones but from stepping stone to stepping stone that's where objectives are very handy so when you want to say i this already kind of looks like something i want to make it more like that i want to make it more into a skull right it already has like two circles and the, kind of the shape but mm -hmm. i'm going to drive it there that that is very that can be very objective driven uh but in the grand scheme of things, you don't know then once you have the skull, right, someone else can develop that into an even new thing. So, yeah, indeed, if if you if you are in kind of a local search in this space, then an objective driven behavior like what you're saying, like I want to make it as much this as possible. Um, that's very that's actually a thing they're advocating for. But then from their end result, yeah, you would need to then restart again, do the same thing with like something else. Yeah, huh. yeah it's really, really interesting. I, just thinking about uh, yeah, I mean, think about like the stepping stones and like uh, is how would you define the space of stepping stones to such a t to any kind of thing? I, I guess it's like you could still design some kind of maybe it's discrete or maybe you have some kind of signal you can get back from it and i guess it's it's just a lot to think about how <laughs> to direct take yeah. away from it. they give this they give this great analogy i feel like um if you have a really ambitious objective it's like crossing a, a lake um but the lake is covered in fog so you basically can't really see very far but you can always kind of see the next stepping stones right and you can then you can then um try to go from stepping stone to stepping stone but you don't know which one to take if there's like a, a fork and there's two ways possible you don't know which one right so all you can do is basically 
go the most interesting one. And they relate this to scientific research. So yeah, if we want to accomplish some really great research goal like artificial general intelligence, uh, we don't like we don't know, but we can see the next stepping stones, right? We can see, oh, from what we have right now, what interesting combination could we make that still kind of it still kind of makes that's like, not to total garbage, right? So in in the local search, I can try to say I want to I don't know I want to do this. I want to do multiple generators and it's multi-stage and then um, this thing, right? Just this is kind of a stepping stone and maybe that will then lead to something more interesting and so on. So yeah, that's that's kind of how they relate. I like this metaphor of the lake. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, could like a meta controller try to put the stones down and then the objective <laughs> is like, or is the space too enormous that that idea of having a meta controller guide yeah. the stepping stone placement is just like absurd and, that, and there's no way that that would work. That's sort of where I'm thinking with this now is like, so they actually that's that's exactly the the question right of what i so i believe you need such a meta whatever um because the space is too large you somehow need a way to choose the the stepping stones in the first place right you somehow need a way to to do this now what they're saying is that if you're if your goal is really ambitious then a meta controller that simply wants to reach the goal is bad because right because what we discussed before you might need a lot of inventions from other fields in order to make the goal happen and if you simply go your field maximum power towards your goal that's not going to happen now if your meta controller is actually just something that wants to produce interesting things then that's actually something they they advocate for that that is exactly what their algorithms are trying to capture. They're trying to capture locally. Yeah, we want to get better at a particular thing. What those particular things are and the order of these, that should be novelty driven instead of goal driven. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, the interesting component. I'm, I guess I'm sort of uh, biased towards liking the objective design. And now I'm thinking like, OK, well, let's abstract those meta controllers one level up and have a meta meta controller and just repeat this until sure. the hierarchy makes sense but I... and that if you if you if you're if you're a bit cynical that is what you will also hear out of hear out of and they have to argue in the in their book a lot against that like isn't the question isn't the kind of um isn't the implementation of a meta controller that just searches for novelty in itself an objective again? And then they give some good reasons why actually you don't, you, it is different. It's more like a constraint um, on your search. If you think of natural evolution, for example, it isn't really, it doesn't really have an objective. Uh, and if you think reproduction and survival is the objective of natural evolution, uh, it, it doesn't really the good the good reason they give is the objective has already been fulfilled by the very first organism to ever live right <laughs> why didn't it stop there right why didn't it stop very first cell okay done we we fulfilled the objective <laughs> right it's it's yeah. more of a it's more of an actually a constrained optimization where the constraint mm -hmm. is you need to be able to survive that's kind of the minimum bar of to being on this planet and then well, I'm saying constrained optimization, but it's it's not it's not an optimization. It's more of like a, a constrained constrained search. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I guess it's just like uh, I definitely think I'm closed in this world of trying to think of these uh, constrained problems, and I haven't really like thought more generally about just like exploration as a whole. But but anyway, so I just wanted to ask you generally like. Uh, you're a deep learning researcher. I want to ask, like, uh, what areas of deep learning are you really interested in right now, and what do you think is uh, promising in the near future? So I'm currently working in adversarial examples. Um, that is a really interesting topic. There's lots of questions uh, still still open, but I'm generally interested in pretty much any anything that is not. I'm not too interested in like the newest 
the newest fine technique on getting the latest state-of-the-art numbers. Um, even though that's probably super important for practitioners. Um, basically agreeing more with the authors of this tutorial of the, that let's just try to do interesting things. And to me, mm. these, these actually the, these, um, these areas in, in terms of open-ended open -ended search, open-ended learning um, are very interesting. I think reinforcement learning still has a long way to go. I think actually NLP still has a long way to go uh, because I don't believe it's the current models are the end of it. So I, I think it's a really exciting time. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I love thinking about adversary examples because it definitely flips the CNN idea on its head. And and then I so I had one other thing about adversarial examples that I'm interested in is uh, there was like an interview with Elon Musk and this Lex Friedman researcher where. He asks him uh, about adversarial examples on his self-driving cars, and he seems dismissive of it. He says he thinks basically you could just uh, average different uh, patches of like test time augmentation to overcome adversarial examples. So, like in your research, do you think that like the example where they add the noise mask to the panda and they're like, oh, it's a given now? If they just perturbed it like nine more times, do you think the prediction would average out to pandas still? Uh, that is a that is a very difficult question, and in from experience, simply adding noise and then feeding it to the classifier, even if you average after that, usually will it will defend against adversarial examples to a point, but it will also degrade your your classification performance, um, because so uh, maybe maybe I understood it wrong, but my understanding is I have my input. Right? And I simply add noise to it and then feed it through the network. And I could do this many times right? and then average the prediction. Um, but usually this will help against adversarial examples, but it will also, it will also degrade the, the accuracy of that classifier. So it might actually make your self-driving car worse in the, in the overall, because how, how often is it going to be attacked against a hmm. adversarial example? Like it's going to be attacked maybe, I don't know, once or twice a year, maybe if, if <laughs> it drives by some, some hacker's house, right? That you put some <laughs> stick, sticker on a stop sign or something. But the rest of the time, I would actually like to retain, retain the best possible classifier. And if I always have to add noise, then that, that's not possible. So the, the research we're doing is actually into the direction of can we retain the original accuracy while still kind of detecting these these samples. It's I mean it's you somehow have to get a trade off somewhere, but mm -hmm. just adding noise isn't the isn't the the, the final solution. Yeah. Oh, so like uh, so with these adversarial examples, they're only going to make misclassifications like that if it really is adversarially sought after. It's not just like the noise perturbation would be such an enormous base to find it otherwise. Is that? Yes, you really need to try. So it's, okay. it's very <laughs> unlikely that, that some random thing, of course, these networks can be confused by random noise, but that, that is, I think one of the self-driving cars once drove into a big white truck because it was large and white, so it thought it was sky. But <laughs> other, like, like um, other than these failures, yeah, you really have to try uh, to find an adversarial example. Really cool. Uh, Yannick, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, anybody watching and listening, uh, definitely check out Yannick's YouTube channel. He has really great paper summaries and all sorts of things. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for having me.